Amen. God is good all the time. Look at somebody and say, hey, I'm glad you're here tonight. Look at somebody else and say, I need Jesus. It's good that we know that. It's good that we know that. It's good to see in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday evening. It's good to come in and hang out a little bit. We've got some special guests. Y'all need to stand up, Joe and Kaylee. These are some good friends. I'll say more, but they're from Iowa. They drove down, needed a vacation, and they came here. How about that? You're all trying to get out of here. Good, good, good stuff right there. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians, we continue going through this letter that Paul penned. We're going to begin reading in verse in chapter number 3 tonight. It says this, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about you, your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, that you love us, that you care for us. And we just declare tonight, God, that we need you. So, Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would come into this place, that you would meet us where we are, that you would encourage us, that you would speak to us. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Paul really just, just speaking from the heart, as he does a lot in this letter, and it's not it's real simple tonight and and like I said Joe's here and so I sort of switch the message I got to do something kind of fired up tonight but you know this is where we're at and Paul's in this place and in the previous verses that we shared about last week he he had been emotional with them and he was sincere and he let them know that that we've missed you man and there's been things that we wanted to come to you but there's things that hindered us anybody ever have anything that hindered us say yeah these things hindered us. The enemy hindered us from coming to you, and we couldn't come with you. And we want you to know that we haven't forgot you. We care deeply about you, and our heart's been hurting for you. And we just want you to know that, like he said last time, he said, even though we weren't physically there, we weren't there in the flesh, that in the spirit we're with you. In the spirit we might, how many of you know that the spirit is not a distance or location can't touch the spirit? See, a lot of times we're, we're worried about our physical relationships we're worried about our physical connections and they're important and the lord uses those but it's these spiritual connections it's these connections that when you see them they reignite and they just they bring you comfort uh, joe cloyd and i we have a spiritual connection he lives in iowa i met joe cloyd because about six seven years ago i went up there and spoke at his church in moravia iowa and he was my armor bearer. He picked me up at the airport he took me around for two days make sure i didn't make a fool of myself too bad and through that time, we developed a spiritual connection. He came down a year later, goes on a walk to Emmaus, and, and we don't talk all the time, but it's like when we do talk, we have this spiritual connection, and it's just an encouragement. And I'm just so proud of what the Lord's done, Joe, within you and for you. And so anyway, Joe being here is, is because of a spiritual connection. We need to work on our spiritual connection. Sometimes I think we take our spiritual connections for granted and we're worried about our fleshly ones instead of these ones that are going to be eternal stuff. You with me? The ones that you can reach out to when you're in a bind that are real and they're sincere and they're based on nothing more than the Lord. So the first thing, I'm just going to pull some things that stuck out to me and go down through these verses. But in verse 1, it's just understanding this, that when we have concern in the Lord, it should lead to action. Concern leads to action, not just worrying or fretting. But in, in verse 1 and 2, we read tonight, and he says, When we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens. And so we sent Timothy to you, our brother, our fellow worker, to strengthen you and encourage you in your faith. 
He's saying this, you are strong in our hearts, and we don't ever want you to think that we just came there and passed through and shared this little message with you, and we don't care about you anymore. We want you to know how much we care, and we understand what you're going through. And, and it's not of our own will that we're not able to come and check in. As a matter of fact, we sent the very best that we have. We didn't just send somebody. We sent our very best. We sent Timothy, who is my spiritual son. Timothy, it, it, we, it's, he said it's better that we be abandoned. When he says it's better that we be left behind, you have to understand, and you know this, of where Paul was at. Paul was in, he was arrested. He was in prison, basically, in Athens. And, 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 and Timothy was someone who helped him, who comforted him, who encouraged him, who, who helped him serve, who did things. He was a great help to Paul. And Paul said, you know what? It's better that I be left and that I send you. Even though Paul's in this place where he doesn't have a lot of friends, and he's in this place, and the Jews are against him. They don't want to hear his message. And he's around Greeks in Athens where they're all about philo philosophical stuff and speaking of mysteries. And so his message that Paul speaks is a very simple message. And so when he's sharing and teaching about Jesus, the Greeks don't want to hear it, which I love. That's probably one of the reasons I love Paul, because his message is simple. It's a, it's a simplicity that's found in Jesus. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to the world, to those who are perishing, but to us who believe and are being saved, it is indeed the power of God. We, he don't, he, you don't need a whole lot of fluff on, on your stuff, but you got to know this. you got to know that Jesus died for you, that Jesus is enough, that Jesus came to help us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says this, Look, I resolved to you to know nothing while I was with you except this one thing. Somebody say one thing. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is the core. There's some more stuff that goes with it, but if you don't have this right, this is the foundation of everything. It's a simple thing. And so they didn't want to hear it. And so Paul's in this difficult spot, but Paul's concern was for the Thessalonians. He's concerned for himself. How many of you know, sometimes when we get so concerned about ourselves, we'll just breed the misery, amen? And Paul said, I'm not going to go there and, and focus on the misery that I'm living in. He said, I'd rather stand in the gap, and I'd rather pray for you guys, and I'm, I'm concerned for you guys. You guys are more important than, than me in my situation. I know where I'm at with the Lord, and I know that God's going to work out all things together for good, but my concern is for my brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, Thessalonica and I'm going to send my son Timothy because you guys are more important than I. You see, when we start placing more value on other people than we do on ourselves, we're going to find uh, we're going to be blessed back. When we start putting more focus on our spouse, when I start focusing more on Tessa and helping her and getting her up and taking care of her, you know what? It's going to bless me back. But so many times in the flesh, we do just the opposite. I'm trying to figure out a way to make my wife serve me, to make my wife love me, to make my wife respect me. And what happens is I get more and more miserable, and we have messed it all up. So it is in the kingdom of God. When we make our focus about lifting other people up, there's nothing that will encourage me in my life more than when I take the focus off of me and I start focusing on helping other people and that's exactly what he is doing and so the second point is encouragement somebody say encouragement in verse 2 he says we sent Timothy so that he would come and share the gospel to strengthen you and encourage you in your faith this, some of this is review a lot of it is but we all need to be encouraged look at somebody and be honest say I need to be encouraged tonight we all need to be encouraged. Sometimes we're playing tough guy. I don't need nothing. I don't need your help. I don't need nothing. But the truth is we all need to be encouraged. Over and over in the Word of God tells us about being encouraged. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul himself says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, and encourage one another. Encourage one another. Not try to get one up on somebody, but encourage one another and be of one mind so that you might live in peace. Encouraging one another brings peace in our midst. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, later in this letter, he says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. But his focus is always on building each other up, Hebrews 3.13. But encourage one another daily, not just every once in a while, but there's always somebody in your path that needs to be encouraged. Encourage each other one 
daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, encouragement goes When we encourage one another and we dwell in unity, it's there that God bestows a blessing on our life. When we're united and we're encouraging one another, it brings peace in our midst. How many of you ever been in a place where you're miserable? But a word of encouragement brings a little peace. You know what? Maybe this day's going to be better than I thought it was this morning. Encouragement brings peace. It brings freedom. It builds us up. It keeps our hearts soft. Some of us get down because I haven't been encouraged. And nobody said a kind word to me. And all of a sudden now, I'm just, my old heart's getting hard because now nobody's encouraged me. And I wish they would have. And I saw them encourage somebody else. And I saw them encourage that family. But they're not encouraging my family. And now all of a sudden, my heart starts getting hard. Are you with me? He says, encourage one another. And he says, that's why we're sending Timothy. I'm sending Timothy to encourage you. And we're going to see in a minute, it's first to encourage them. But Paul understands this equation, then it's going to come back, and it's going to encourage him as well. So it's encouragement, and number three is this. Difficulty, and you're not going to like this, but you know this. Difficulty, somebody say difficulty, is part of the calling. It's part of the calling. He says in verse three, he says, look, we don't want you to be troubled by our affliction." We don't want you to be troubled. We told you in advance that we were going to suffer some affliction. This is a little bit different than the prosperity gospel that sometimes we hear about. When everything's about blessing and everything's about everything going my way and getting it my way, this is way different than that. Paul said, we told you that we're going to be afflicted. We don't want you getting, getting down about it because Paul's concern, again, wasn't that going through stuff it wasn't that things weren't going his way it wasn't that he didn't look like a poster child for for some glorious thing his concern is for the Thessalonic Thessalonians that their faith would be weakened because of his difficulty because they looked to this guy and according to what he had told them and if they think that he told them because they got saved and they accepted Jesus that life was going to be easy he didn't want them falling away because he was going through difficulty He was concerned about their faith. He's saying, I don't want you to be surprised at these struggles. I told you that there was a good chance that we were going to suffer some stuff. And I don't want you to be surprised when you're opposed because he knew that they were being opposed. He knew that they were going through persecution. And he was concerned about their faith. He wasn't concerned about the outside stuff. He was concerned about what's on the inside. He was concerned about their faith. That their faith would not fail. How many of you know this? Trouble and pressure can make us give in. Trouble and pressure and difficulty can make us want to give up when it's just not easy. It's just easier to go hide somewhere. It's easier to lay down. It's easier. As Christians, we lower our standards instead of raising them. And how many of you know, God says in the Old Testament that you should raise up a standard, that you don't act like everyone else. He says in 2 Peter, he says that you are, a, or 1 Peter, you are a, You're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen nation. You're to be different and set apart. Don't act like the world. See, sometimes we look at the Old Testament and he says, well, don't marry them and don't intermarry with them and don't do what they're doing. It wasn't because he didn't like them. It was because he understood this, that you need to raise up a standard. And if you get caught up doing what everybody else is doing, you're going to fall in and you're going to fit in and be just like them instead of being pulled apart and standing up for the glory of God. We begin to dim our lights instead of shine them see there is this idea and we've just said this many times but there's this idea and i don't know if it just it's just in man or it's just been communicated but i think we have this idea that if we become a christian and if we accept jesus that life's going to be easy and we know that that's not the gospel message of jesus that's not the gospel that the, that the disciples lived out. And I'm not saying that you're cursed because you're not cursed. You are, we're blessed and highly favored no matter what we're facing. But it's understanding that we live in this fallen world. The truth is life is difficult. Can we say it is? We're not hiding from it. We're not, some of us are, oh, I'm just so good, man. Life's just so good, you know. And we're in public and, oh, bless God, I'm just doing great. You know? But then we go home and we have this lockdown because we've been outside trying to play spiritual angel, acting like our life is perfect and we don't have no, no trouble in our life when the reality is we all have trouble. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this earth, but take courage 
and have peace because I have overcome the world. Listen, there's nothing wrong with us because we face trouble. There's nothing wrong with us when we admit that we're struggling. Let us be real. Can we be real? People relate to real. They want to see people that admit that they can struggle and still serve Jesus. Amen? There's not something wrong with us. We know this, though. We can walk through difficulties and we can walk through struggles because the Lord is with us no matter where we are. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I can make it because, God, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, your presence is strengthening me. And I'm not going to stay stuck here because you've called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We're going to keep going even through the, the middle of a storm. 1 Peter 5.10 says, after you have suffered for a little while, this is Peter telling all the people he's writing to. He didn't say, except Jesus, you'll never have trouble again. He says, after you've suffered for a little while, after you've went through some stuff, the God of all grace, he then, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, he will perfect you and confirm you and strengthen you and establish you. Again, just saying, hey, it's okay, but you're going to make it through this if you keep your faith. You keep your faith. And Paul wanted to make sure that the Thessalonians were keeping their faith. They weren't weakening because he was struggling. How about that? He's more concerned not about his own situation, not about his own loss, not about his own, but about where they were going, how they were going to respond to it. He cared about them this much. And so number four is our faith. Somebody say faith. He says in verse 5, For this reason, when I could endure it no longer... I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He wanted to make sure that they were standing strong in their faith. He said, I can't take it anymore and I'm, I'm too concerned and I can't just sit. Even though I'm praying and we're praying for you continually, it says in later verses. But he says, I, it moved me to send my son Timothy. Send Timothy to check on you to make sure you're standing strong in your faith. Because he knew Hebrews eleven six. It says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. How many of you would agree that when our faith is strong? When my faith is strong, we can stand in the toughest storm. I can face difficulties. I can face things in my life when my faith is strong. But when my faith begins to get weak a little bit, the smallest little incident can beat me down. The smallest little thing can frustrate me. And, and when my, weak, my faith is weak, I, I hear voices and I, I hear rumors and I hear what people say. And all of a sudden, I begin to put my head in a hole and want to hide somewhere. And I don't think I'm going to make it through anything. And I get anxiety and I get depressed and I get angry. When our faith is strong, Paul says, keep your faith. He says, for I had fear that the tempter may have tempted you. Had fear that the tempter may have tempted you. So we know this first. When he says this, uh, what he's really saying is, I had a fear. He knows that the tempter tempts. Amen? I mean, even Jesus was tempted. We're all going to be tempted. What he's really saying, he's speaking in a nice way. And he says, I, I, I was afraid that you would, had... had because you've been tempted, you were going to lose your faith. That you were going to go a different direction. Because he knows who the tempter is. Who's the tempter? The enemy, Satan, the devil, the fallen angel, whatever you're comfortable with. It's not people. The tempter is, is not people. Sometimes we do this often, but it's, it's easy to do because we relate to them. And we always think it's people. It's not people. Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against rulers, against powers and authorities and principalities in the heavenly realms that are coming against us. They're the one, it's, that's the one. He's the tempter. The enemy's the tempter. He wants to tempt us. He wants to get us angry at each other. He wants to get us to lose our faith, to lose our focus, to get down. He's tempting us. But unfortunately, he uses people. He often works through people. And Paul knows that they've been tempted and he knows how the enemy works, and he is afraid that not only they've been tempted, but they've given in. He's afraid that they weren't able to stand. The rest of that passage in Ephesians 6, talking about the armor of God. He was afraid that they weren't able to stand. He was afraid that they couldn't stand strong in the Lord's might with the armor of God, that they didn't have their suit on, that they weren't wrapped up with the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and their feet shod with the gospel, with the helmet of salvation. He was afraid that they weren't prepared, that they didn't know enough word to have the sword of the Spirit. 
And Paul wanted simply this. He wanted reassurance of their faith. Because he knew that if they were standing strong, it was going to be an encouragement to him. And we see in verse 6 and 7 that Paul was comforted when he got the report. And he says, but now that Timothy has come back, has come to us from you, and he's brought good news of your faith and your love, and that you always think kindly of us as we do of you, longing to see us. For this reason, even in our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through our faith. Paul was comforted even though he's in a prison, even though he doesn't have any freedom. He's comforted by Timothy's report. And he like immediately writes this letter, it almost seems like. He was so glad of their faith and their love. Somebody say, faith and love. Faith and love. It embodies almost like the whole duty of a man. They, the Word of God says, now these three, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. Faith on this end, love on the, this end. And the greatest of these is love. We know faith Simple definition is something like this. It's to know. It's to believe and trust God above all else. Even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, I trust God. By faith, I believe that God's going to get my family through this. By faith, I know that, that God's working in the middle of this situation. We believe by faith. And then love is like the most powerful force. There's nothing stronger than love. And love like enables or it activates our faith. Without love, it is impossible to do a lot of things. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 about the power of love. And it says you can prophesy, you can speak in other tongues, you can do all this stuff, you can move mountains, and they can move and be thrown into the sea. But it says if you have not love, then you're nothing but making a lot of noise. You're nothing but taking up space. But he says your faith and your love. When I heard about that, because when these two things come together, all of a sudden it's something that is unstoppable. I can believe and I can present myself as righteous. I can look good. I can leave the house with a plan. I can dress up. I can say the right stuff when I'm in public. I can look good. But until I love, until I love, I am foreign to the things of God. I'm foreign and I can't really walk in the things of the kingdom. I'm just going to, for a second, about me. I knew a point in my life that God was calling me. I knew that he was asking me to do some stuff. I didn't really know the details. But I knew God had lit this fire in me. And, I, and, and, and I've been honest with all of you, and you've heard me say that I struggle with people. I struggle with people. A lot of them I didn't like. And the reason that I struggle with people was because I'd seen how people disappoint. And I see how people let you down. I see how people play games. It ticks me off to this day. I see it in church, and people playing games in the church we have to quit playing games if God is ever really going to move in our lives and I'd seen all this stuff and and so that's why I struggle with people but what I really found out the reason I struggle is because of this I hadn't learned to love them and see them like God saw them. that's why I struggle with people and it's been a long process and God began to break my heart and when God broke my heart through the process, and he began to show me how much he really loved me, and all of a sudden I began to see people the way he saw them, and all of a sudden now my heart was changed, and I learned what love really looked like. And I'm not saying I'm a perfect lover of people, but I'm just saying until I learned how to do that, God really couldn't do anything with me for the kingdom. And once he broke my heart for people, all of a sudden, he began to open doors, and, and I began to see God do things that, that were almost mind-blowing. And I say that to say this. When I think about Peter, Peter was with Jesus, and Peter believed in Jesus, and Peter loved Jesus, and Peter was a stinking bulldog. Peter was a man that had so much faith that he said, tell me to get out of the boat, and he walked on water because he had faith. Peter was a man that was ready to fight for Jesus. I'll die with you tonight. I'll whack this dude's ear off. I'm not afraid. I am ready to die with you, Jesus. He had faith. But watch this. He denied Jesus. He denied Jesus. And, and there for an instant, he was out of the 11. He was out of the group. Do you know what brought Peter back in? Love. Let me show you this. In John chapter 21 when Jesus reinstates Peter he does it like this 
in verse 15. Three times he asked him. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. And he asked him again in verse 16. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, you know I love you. Yes, I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. And in verse 17, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, come on, man. Yeah, you know all things. You know I love you. And again, he says, feed my sheep. The third time that Jesus asked, do you love me? It says Peter was grieved. And we always think, well, it hurt his feelings because Jesus was questioning. But I would tell you that the Lord gave me this revelation that what he did was he broke Peter's heart. Because every time he would say, do you love me? And he would look at Jesus and he would say, yeah, I love you. And Jesus would turn him around and say, now feed my sheep. He made him look at Jesus and then he let him look at the people. And through this little encounter, I believe that God broke Peter's heart for people. And he said, it's not about you being a bull, and it's not about you being prideful, and it's not about you having this just belief system, but it's about you having a heart for these people that I came and died for, that I came to share good news with. And until you have a heart for people, Peter, you're never really going to be the instrument that I've called you to be. And so it is with you and I. We can love Jesus, and we can go to church, and we can do works, and we can do some stuff. But until we really learn to love and serve out of that place, God's never really going to fulfill and do as much. <clears throat> so we must believe God, faith, and then we operate out of a place of love. We have faith, and we have love. And so in verse 7, he says, because of this, amidst all of our trouble, we were comforted by hearing of your unwavering faith. He says, you have no idea how it blessed me. We have no idea. When I see other people, when I talk to Jill Cloy, when I see some of you guys and the stuff you walk with your families and you deal with, you have no idea how it blesses me because I see that God is at work. And I see that people are stepping into, and, 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 and people are growing, and, and God is, is, is alive. Because of this, he says, we're comforted when we're here about you handling this stuff, your unwavering faith. In verse 8, he says, for now we really live. For now, getting this report, hearing about you, we really live as long as you stand firm in the Lord. Here's the thing. Like Jesus, Paul had a heart. For people. Jesus had a heart for people. Paul had a heart for people. Everything Paul did on this side of his, his salvation, on this side of his experience with Jesus on the Damascus Road, everything he did was to reach people for Jesus. It wasn't about him doing his thing. It wasn't about him getting his way. It wasn't about him avoiding trouble. It was all about reaching people for Jesus. He says, if we... We really live when you stand firm. This is what keeps us alive. This is what keeps us going. This is what motivates us. Christ came for people, and that's why Paul said, not I live, but Christ lives. I want to do the same thing. I want to pour my life out as a drink offering, even for the Lord. So music team, you come help me. Because of his love for people, and because he saw that his work wasn't in vain, he was willing to suffer persecution, Suffering, imprisonment, even to the point of his soon coming death, he was willing as long as it was serving God's purposes. Reaching people for Jesus. Is that our, is that our concern? Hey, listen. We want to see God move, amen? And my heart is this, you know, if it ever gets to the point where I'm, God's not moving through what we're doing and through my leadership... You know what? We need to start praying for the next one that's supposed to come. Because I don't want to do it if God's not doing anything. I don't need attention, and I don't need something to do. And this was Paul's heart. He says, I'm willing to do this because I believe and I see that God's moving. And I believe that God wants us to have a heart this much yearning that we want to see God move. So I close with this. Do we have a godly concern for people? I know we worry about people. Do we, do we have a concern that will move us to action? That will move us to, to make a phone call? To meet a need? To encourage? 
through Paul, and he says, man, I want to encourage you. I want to come alongside. I want to do whatever I can. Let us not be confused about our afflictions. It's part of the calling, and you know what? God works through us. He grows us, and that's all. When, when people take notice, when they see you going through stuff, man, people take notice. Man, Casey Henserling, you're always smiling. You always, you Henserling, you just, man, you, wow. They see it, man. They see your family going through loss, and you're on church on Sunday morning. We got two families, the whole family, the Hendricks family. Just suffered loss. Man, it was painful. And you showed up to worship God. Man, people take notice. Are you kidding me? Like, wow. I don't I went off the deep end for at least two weeks, you know. Not y'all. What's going on here? Like, people notice. God works through your pain, even moments we don't understand. We're thinking, what's the point? And God's saying, man, you have no idea what I'm doing right here. You have no idea about somebody I'm reaching. You have no idea. The changes that are being made. Don't be confused about it. Paul encouraged others. Timothy encouraged others. We need to encourage others. Because as Paul encouraged them, guess what? The results came back. And they encouraged him. He wasn't there, but he was encouraging them. He was praying for them. And the report that came back, it encouraged him. said, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going to write some more letters. I'm just going to encourage some more people. Here's the key. I'm done. We must, somebody say, we must have a heart for God and a heart for people. We must. If God's really going to move, things are really going to happen. Those two are a must. Faith and love. We believe God and we move out of love. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We get, thank you, God. That you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be made right. So that we could have healing. We could have deliverance. That you would meet our needs. That you would come alongside of us. That you would empower us to walk as children of God. And so Lord as we see what you've done Father I pray that we would receive that and our faith would begin to rise up. And because of our faith we would see what you did and it would touch our hearts that we would not only be saved but we will be transformed into a people that love other people. Give us a heart not only to be saved, God, but a heart to love people the way you love them. And let our faith and our love move us on your behalf to encourage others exactly where they're at. God, I just pray that you move in this place tonight. Some of us are hurting, and we admit that. Some of us are going through difficulty. And let us know it's okay to admit that. And so, Lord, if we're here tonight and we need encouragement, I pray that we'd come to an altar and we might bring somebody with us. Or we just come in your presence and ask you to encourage us. And if we know of somebody that's hurting and we know that somebody that's going through something, God, we would take initiative tonight to encourage them. We would step out of our comfort zone and, and we wouldn't try to read their mail. We'd just tell them we love them. And we'd say a short prayer to let them know and remind them of how much God loves them. And there's other people that love them. Father, what are you speaking to us tonight? Move upon our hearts. Meet us where we are. And move us to become more like you. Lord, we love you. And we just ask you to have your way as we close in worship. In Jesus' name, if you need prayer, we'll certainly pray with you. The altars are going to be open as they sing over us. Just ask you to seek the Lord and remember how he loves you and how he wants to encourage you this night.